When a serial rapist is striking over and over again in a really small, confined area, I want to be involved as soon as possible. We know this guy is going to keep doing this, and we need to do something to stop him. We knew these cases were all related because the victims were all elderly, and the offender was taking his clothes off before he started the attack. Daytona Beach Shores. One night, the peace of this quiet retirement community is shattered. A 63-year-old woman is assaulted in her own bedroom by an attacker who is completely naked. Daytona Beach Shores, Florida. 63-year-old Jean Williams had been attending a women's club meeting all evening. It is past her normal bedtime when she turns off the light at half past 10. I check the house over. I always do when I come in to make sure it's safe. And everything's locked up good, nobody's here. But the retired bank employee is about to be targeted for violence. I woke up between 12 and 1. I don't know why I woke up or if somebody woke me up, but all I know is I woke up and I felt a little bit hungry. So I came out of the bedroom, started toward the kitchen. When she rounds the corner, she is confronted by something as astonishing as it is terrifying. There is a man in her kitchen, and he's completely naked. He jumped out behind the this wall and grabbed me, put his hand around my face and whirled me around. And when he did, he drugged me by the organ bench and had a sharp corner on it and he cut my leg and he drugged me into the bedroom where he attacked me. When he finishes the assault, her naked attacker flees through a sliding glass door. Jean Williams never gets a good look at him. She calls the police. It's about 1.30 a.m. When the police arrive at her house, all Jean Williams can tell them is that her attacker is a white male and he wasn't wearing any clothes. When they process the crime scene, investigators find a DNA sample on Jean Williams' bedsheet. They're also able to determine that the assailant has taken $8 from her purse. But without a good description of the attacker, Investigators can only keep an eye out for a faceless white male walking the streets, an anonymous criminal who might be preparing to attack again. It's easy to become a victim. People never think it's going to happen to them. Most never see it coming. Lead detective Tom Murphy is assigned to the case. As he walks the neighborhood looking for leads, he is struck by the bizarre nature of this crime. In reviewing the case, the outstanding issue that caught our eye was the fact that the perpetrator had entered into the house naked and fled naked. Detective Murphy hopes this particular piece of information will help in his hunt for the man who assaulted Gene Williams, though no one has reported seeing a naked man running through the neighborhood. As the investigation begins, police receive several calls from elderly women reporting late night robberies in their homes. Investigators suspect that the women are also being assaulted by the naked intruder, but are too humiliated to report the attacks. Lead detective Tom Murphy suspects that he has a serial rapist on his hands. The neighborhood is becoming more concerned because of their age being common with the victims. I decided to call in additional resources, one of which being Dale Hinman from The Profiler. Dale Hinman is used to cases like this one. Hardly any evidence, no eyewitness descriptions, and no suspect. But the rapist's unusual behavior reveals something about who he is. 
One of the key facts that we looked at in the profile of this series of cases was that the offender was approaching the victims after he was already in the home and naked. This meant that he knew who was present in these scenes and that the cases were all related. What were the chances of someone else breaking into homes in the same area and also being naked? An expert on sex crimes, Special Agent Hinman was trained as a profiler by the FBI and has worked on hundreds of sexual assault cases. Even though investigators have few clues in the Daytona Shores case, the choice of victims gives Hinman some ideas about how this particular criminal is operating. If you look at a neighborhood and all the victims are a certain age group, what are the chances that the person would look upon only victims that met a certain age criteria or a certain physical description? So what this means to us is the individual is stalking people in the area, conducting surveillance, and finding people that meet a certain criteria. Daytona Beach Shores, Florida. In this quiet retirement community, a serial rapist is terrorizing elderly women. Investigators are in a race against time, trying to catch him before he strikes again. I stayed over at my next door neighbors because I'd look at my house over here and I was afraid. I, it just did something to me to look at my house and I would cry to think somebody had come in my house and done that to me. Profiler Dale Hinman arrives in Daytona Beach Shores to join the investigation. The first thing she does is visit the neighborhood where the assaults occurred, looking for anything that might help her to identify the mysterious attacker. I like to drive around in the crime scene area at about the time when the assaults occurred because it gives me an idea of how many street lights there are, how many people are out at a certain time of day, how much movement is there. So it gives me a good idea for how high risk this crime was for the offender. As a first step to developing a profile, Hinman analyzes what she knows so far. All of the victims are roughly the same age. And that happens because the individual is stalking the victims and he's walking around in this neighborhood looking for particular types of victims. Someone who would want vulnerable victims would be someone who maybe had some real problems with their own masculinity or their confidence level, that they would choose victims that they could easily control. Hinman's preliminary profile narrows the field of suspects to some degree, but it's still like looking for a needle in a haystack. If she hopes to help police catch the attacker, Hinman needs to focus her profile even more. Hinman decides she needs more information about the crimes that have been committed so far. She meets with lead detective Tom Murphy for a case file review. Once again, clues can be found in the most unusual aspect of the attacks. The outstanding feature that we found in all these cases was the perpetrator, when he would enter the house, he would be seen in the house uh, completely naked. What that means to me is that the perpetrator had already entered the house and had already searched for whatever uh, valuables were available and gathered them all up before he contacted the victim. So that gave him an opportunity to search and undress and make himself ready for the sexual assault. It's most likely that... The fact that the perpetrator undresses completely before he assaults his victims tells Agent Hinman something about his background and his frame of mind. This is the second meeting... He's used to being in other people's homes, and he feels comfortable in other people's homes, and that would be more likely to be translated into he feels comfortable doing burglaries, and that would be his past. Agent Hinman's profile is slowly coming into focus. She thinks police should be looking for a white male with a history of petty crime, including burglary. Hinman hopes that by concentrating on this element of the crime, she can narrow the pool of potential suspects. Someone who doesn't disguise himself and the crimes are so close together and he's slovenly dressed and these all play into the idea of the profile that the individual has a unskilled or menial type job or is unemployed because he needs money 
if money was totally unimportant, why not just do the sexual assault and then leave the money alone? If he's someone who needs money, he probably lives with someone else. But if he's living with someone else, how is he able to, on different nights of the week, get up and leave and then come back without the other person becoming suspicious and ask him where they're going? Agent Hinman's profile assumes that police should look for an unemployed man who possibly lives with a subservient female, someone who would tolerate his absences without asking too many questions. But before the profile can help turn up any solid leads, there's another attack. Once again, a woman in her 60s wakes up to find a naked intruder looming over her bed. The man sexually assaults her. Then he runs out the back door. When police arrive at the scene, the victim can't describe the attacker, and once again, less than $10 is missing. A canine unit is called in to track the perpetrator. The dogs locate a scent and track it to the back of a nearby motel. When body of evidence returns, will investigators identify the naked rapist before he attacks again? Daytona Beach Shores, a serial rapist, is terrorizing this retirement community. He has already attacked several elderly women, each time appearing in their homes completely naked. But at the scene of the latest attack, investigators have picked up what looks like a hot trail. A police dog has located the scent of the perpetrator and is following it without hesitation. The dog tracked the scent to River Shore Motel and Cottages, and this is actually a residential apartment complex, not a motel where people come and go. Well, the dog stopped at apartment number four. Of course, the officers knocked on the door and a young woman answered, but she said that she lived there alone. There was no one else present. Investigators see no reason to question her further. But they do take down her name and address, Ellen Cherise Bracco, the Rivershore Motel. Meanwhile, they continue talking to other neighbors. But once again, Detective Tom Murphy comes up empty-handed. The trail of the serial rapist has gone cold. He turns to profiler Dale Hinman for help one more time. The uh, distance between the furthest north and the furthest south points was approximately a mile, maybe a little bit less. And the peninsula is less than a half mile across. Having all these crimes so close together and no other similar ones farther up in the peninsula or over here on the island, what that would mean to me is that the offender in this case was really comfortable in this area. Agent Hinman's theory also explains why neighbors have not noticed anything unusual before or after the attacks. He belongs here and nobody really notices him as he's walking up and down the street because he just fits in in this area. Investigators decide to keep the entire neighborhood under surveillance, even though they're not sure exactly what they're looking for. As part of our attempts to identify him and capture him, we would work at night walking these streets as if we were citizens walking dogs. Uh, we rode bikes. Uh, at times, we'd even hide in the bushes and just kind of see who was going around and try to identify anybody that was unusual or suspicious in the area. But right under their watch, the assailant strikes again. In this attack, a 54-year-old woman is confronted by a man who climbs into her second-story bedroom. But this time, to his surprise, the woman fights back. And instead of becoming violent himself, the man retreats through the window, climbs back down the ladder, and disappears. This is a man who is used to women who are much more vulnerable, women who will do what he says when he says to do certain things. And the fact that she struggled and fought with him, all that he wanted to do at this point is to leave. Police rush to the scene and find the victim in shock, which isn't unusual. What is unusual is the degree of shock. The woman is suffering from almost total amnesia. She can't remember anything. So Detective Murphy attempts to jog the victim's memory with the help of an unusual technique. 
So we ask her to, to reenact this, this crime, if you will. And of course she lay down in the bed and we, we informed her and said, we're gonna, we're gonna come in the same way that we feel that he did. And, and let's try, try to walk us through this incident. And, I, and I, I just put my knee on the bed and kind of came over and says, now tell me what happened next. And all of a sudden she rolled over and she says, I can tell you everything about him. With her memory back, the victim supplies enough specific details to help police artists sketch a composite. The Daytona Shores rapist finally has a face. We did a composite we could put a face to, and then we could distribute to our people to say, here's who we're looking for now. Go out and find him. Then, a lucky break. Detective Murphy receives a routine booking report on a burglary suspect in an unrelated case. When he takes a look at the suspect's mugshot, alarms go off. I viewed the booking photographs of the, of the shore suspect, both the facial frame and the full body shot, and noticed the, the distinctive similarities between this suspect and the descriptions provided to us by our victims and our assaults. And when I looked over, I was shocked to see the address which he had listed as his home address. It is room number four at the Rivershore Motel, the same address a police dog had led investigators to when they tracked the scent of the escaping rapist only a few months earlier. Up next are this man and this man, one and the same. Police finally have a strong suspect in the serial rape cases that have terrorized Daytona Beach shores for months. A man resembling their composite sketch has been taken into custody after robbing a local residence. His name is Carmelo Bracco. His address is the same one located by a police tracking dog after one of the sexual assaults. But at the time, a woman had answered the door and claimed she lived alone. Her name, Ellen Sharice Bracco. Can you even imagine the surprise that all of us had when the investigation led back to apartment number four? This woman had been interviewed in the past and she said she lived there alone. There was no reason to doubt her at that time. So police decide to pay the woman another visit. When confronted with the facts of the case, she admitted that Carmelo Bracco was in fact a resident there and identified him as her husband. Mrs. Bracco admits that her husband is off and out all night and consents to a search of their rooms. This time when the wife was interviewed, she confirmed a number of the points of my profile. Bracco was unemployed at the time of the assault, so he had unlimited time to target his victims. His wife was a subservient type of person and allowed him to come and go whenever he pleased. And they lived in the immediate area of the assaults. Detective Murphy decides it's time to visit Bracco in jail, where he's being held on a burglary charge. We started talking to him and confronting him with information that we learned from the interview of his wife. Uh, he was denying any involvement in any of our incidents. Surprisingly, when investigators ask Bracco for a DNA sample, he readily consents. But is it because he's innocent? or ignorant. You can measure a person's level of criminal experience and their background and their forensic knowledge by what they're willing to do or say regarding evidence. I think a lot of the offenders don't realize that your DNA is in your hair, it's in your saliva, it's in your blood, it's in your semen. And that by asking for a blood sample and hair samples, I don't think that he knew that the DNA was the DNA was the DNA. Bracco's hair and blood are sent to the lab for comparison to samples found at the crime scenes. The DNA comparison is a match. Carmelo Bracco is the Daytona Beach Shores rapist. The district attorney is prepared to bring charges against Bracco, but he'll need testimony from the victims to make his case. And none of them want to appear in court, except one. Bracco's first target, Gene Williams. I don't know why they didn't testify, but uh, 
my feeling on something like that is I was in my bed. I was locked in. I was behaving myself. I'm not a rounder. I did not ask for that. And I feel like, why should I be ashamed? I was a victim. I didn't ask for it. And I felt like he should pay the price for what he did. Her decision to confront her attacker in the courtroom seals Carmelo Bracco's fate. When it came time for trial, Carmelo had to then look at the possibility of facing his victim on the stand. And at that point, or at some point after that, he struck a deal with the state and pled to the charge. Carmelo Bracco is sentenced to 20 years in prison. I was so glad when they finally put Carmelo Bracco away. Everyone involved in this investigation saw these victims as our own mothers, as our own grandmothers. Everybody in this entire community was just completely outraged by this attack, waiting for it to happen again. Once a rapist starts, it's probably impossible for him to stop unless we stop him. <laughs>